Hi everyone, let's welcome our next speaker, Niels. He works at bold.com and his focus areas are around scale and reliability. Uh, he's uh, Niels is an active open source developer, a PMC member of uh, the Apache Avro project. He contributes to other projects like Hadoop, HBase, Flink, Beam, and Storm. This year at Berlin Buzzwords, Niels is going to speak about when your stream doesn't stream very well. So let's have it for Niels. Hi. So welcome. This time I am going to talk about experiences from the wild when building actual streaming applications and things move differently than you expect. So a bit of an agenda. I'm going to briefly talk about our context um, in which I am creating these systems. Um, we're talking about streaming solutions and specifically about broken and problematic streams. I'm also going to explain how these systems work, at least the basics, and then also include solutions directions uh, that we are working on and some final conclusions. First, a bit of background uh, from about me um, for those who don't know me yet. I have a background in both computer science and business. I have been doing software development, uh, algorithm research, and architecture uh, for a long time. Nowadays, I put corporate inventor on my business card because that best explains what I really do. And I uh, contribute to a lot of uh, open source projects, and I speak at quite a few conferences. So the context where I work is ball.com. It's an online retailer. Uh, we sell stuff. Uh, we sell lots of stuff. <clears throat> In fact, we have over 20 to 23 million items uh, actually available right now. It varies per day. So this is uh, from, a few, from a while ago. And one of the things you need to do in order to make sure that customers are able to find their products is personalization. So because I'm recognized, we do all kinds of changes to the pages to make sure that the person is able to find what they're looking for. So we have a new service in my region. I get to see that. We have some general advertising. Uh, and these are based on the fact that I have kids that like movies uh, like Harry Potter and uh, Transformers, but also I like to play games. And in addition, I looked at something, hey, maybe other things are interesting as well and uh, products, items I uh, looked at before. You can understand that uh, in order to make all of this as real time as possible, we do quite a bit of stream processing nowadays. We use both Apache Flink and Apache Beam in a lot of our production scenarios. And for this talk, I have uh, constructed a very simple example use case that is actually something I tried to build and failed and ran into a lot of problems. And I'm going to explain those problems to you. In this case, this, it's a person behind a laptop who visits our website and the interaction events go into Kafka. I spoke on this project last year at this conference. So look back at that uh, if you're more interested about that. In this example, I'm attaching a very simple Flink SQL statement because I want to uh, get a graph on the number of page views per hour. So this Flink SQL is then stored in HBase in this example. So you can attach something that shows you a graph. Now let's pull this very simple application apart into the elements that, um, uh, that I had problems with. And the first thing to realize is that time is essential. In our use case, I am saying interval one hour. So the main question is then, what kind of time are we talking about? Are we talking about event time? Are we interested in reporting on the time that the event originally occurred? If we build a processing around this concept, that is nice because in case of a processing disruption, uh, eventually consistent, the end result will remain the same because the end result solely depends on the data. Systems like Flink also support ingestion time and processing time, which is essentially the time the data arrived in the processing system or in the, in, in the source and where it was processed. It's important to realize that if you build something on top of this, 
that in case of a processing disruption, the result will be different because the processing time will be later than expected. So the end result really depends on both the data and the operations of the processing system. Now, the most common example to explain all this is the Star Wars, where we have the story time, uh, event time that goes from episode one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Yet the arrival of the movies was that we first got the middle three, then the first three, and then the last three, and the side stories were dabbled in between in a wrong order also. And then later on, they created a nice series called The Mandalorian, which is also somewhere halfway. So processing time is a fundamentally different thing than event time. And looking at the things around me, I see that, for example, uh, in operations, a lot of times you need processing time because you need to know when something actually happened, how the operations of a system actually behaved. What you see here is a disturbance we had in one of our Flink processing tasks um, in, our, in our production environment. It went down for an hour and then had an enormous bubble of uh, higher processing uh, to catch up what it uh, still had to do. In this example, uh, we are doing web stats. We want to know the reporting on the event time. We want reporting on when something really happened. The second part of the application that needs addressing is the group by event time, because that's what we're doing. We're doing a group by hour. <clears throat> Now, if you're doing a group buy on a fixed data set, that is nice because you have an overview of all events in there. And you can simply sort them, group them, and then have the group buy of whatever field you feel like. But this is a forever changing data set. It's a never ending stream. It is impossible to have an overview of all events. So if you want to do a group by type of operation, you have to do it slightly different. And streaming systems like Flink use the concept of a window, which is essentially a group by buffer. You incrementally fill it with events as they arrive and then have some kind of assessment of completeness. And when that assessment arrives, you take all of these events and you ship them out for further processing. So when is a window complete? The construct they use is called watermarks. These are special records in the data stream that are hidden from the application, but are there for the framework to react on. So a window sees them, but the application code doesn't. And they simply indicate that there will no, be no more older events. So if you see them, you can respond by shipping out the window. And it's common to base them on the data um, which gives you an estimate or a guess of completeness. There are situations where you guess wrong. I'm not going to in, uh, going into those situations in this talk. So a very simple application. Uh, we create uh, um, uh, records, throw them in Kafka and then into a Flinker thing. So the first thing to realize is that you, when you start it, the window has a sense of uh, last seen watermark, which is very long time ago, age of the dinosaurs. Well, actually, it's Min Long, which is uh, 292 million years ago, and the first dinosaurs only appeared 50 million years later. So it's even older than the dinosaurs, but you get the idea. So my application creates an event that goes through Kafka into the application and goes into a bucket that is grouped for the uh, 11 o'clock window. And then another event arrives. And then some part of the code says, hey, um, I saw something occur and I choose now to insert a watermark. So it inserts a watermark for 1205, which replaces our dinosaur. And then the application says, ooh, the 11 o'clock window is complete. I can ship it out and use it for the reporting. The first thing to notice is that Kafka is not a simple pipe. A Kafka consists of a uh, Kafka topic persists, uh, consists of partitions, and partitions are essentially smaller pipes that each give ordering guarantees, and you can have a lot of them to have a large scalability, um, but on a per pipe basis there are ordering guarantees. So our application really looks a bit like this. 
per incoming pipe, you can have a source component. You can also have source components doing multiple, but let's keep it at a one-on-one -on -one example for this talk. So again, our application starts firing these events, same as before. But now you see that uh, it has for each incoming source, it has a separate um, uh, memory of what is the latest watermark. So then at the other one, a message arrives and only then the assessment is, weighed, uh, is made that the 11 o'clock is, is finished. The third part in the application that we need to think about is the writing to the database, that part. If you use HBase, uh, and I'm using this as an example, I truly uh, see that uh, in a lot of other database systems, you see similar effects. Writing to a database, you have a method that puts in a single record. Now, in the case of HBase, there is a remote call to the database server that puts that single record in, and you have to wait for the network latency for it to return, which can be quite slow if you have a lot of them. So that is why in HBase, they have something called a buffered mutator, which actually buffers two megabytes of mutations. And when the buffer is full, it does a single call to the backend writing in, uh, away. That is, if you have a lot of uh, measurements, uh, a lot faster. So I have this application, I run it on my laptop and I get no output at all. And I kind of panic. Well, it's important to realize that some streams don't stream very well. And over the years, I have come to recognize four situations for classes of streams that don't stream very well. And the first is slow streams, streams with a, with a very low event rate. The second is slim streams, ev on, uh, streams that only have events in, in one or a few Kafka partitions. There are streams that I call bursty or batchy, where you have bursts of events and then long gaps in between those. This is by design, usually. And there are broken streams, also with large gaps, but now caused by the disruption or by maintenance. So let's look at some of those, some examples of this. I have encountered a combination of slow and slim streams on our test environment. So let's get back to our example application. You know, I'm on the uh, test environment and I'm clicking on our website. Uh, so I'm producing uh, some events that are stored in Windows and the watermarks arrive. Um, and then if you look back also to my other talk, what you see is that we have said we are doing a partition by session ID. That way, every event for a single session goes into a single Kafka partition, which means that the ordering is maintained. And then also at the end of Flink, depending on the application, of course, we have the option of maintaining that ordering by doing a key by session ID. And that is very nice. But in this situation, I'm alone. I'm alone on this website. And that means that I have to have wait a really, really long time before somebody else creates an event that takes that dinosaur away. Because only when that dinosaur is away can my window be shipped out. And you see that only the 11 o'clock window is shipped out because the 12 o'clock window does not have a guarantee from all inputs that it is finished. Now this drawing only shows you two Kafka partitions, but in our production environment, we have over 240. That has to do with the number of hard drives in our Kafka cluster. But this is not all why I don't get any data. The other reason is that we're writing to HBase. And over there is the buffered mutator. So the windows that go in are by far not enough to flush the buffer. Another very common example I've seen is slim streams. And something we ran into a couple of years ago when we first started with our project is that on acceptance, we run load tests. So we have a load generator, some kind of robot that produces traffic to test the website. And 
in this processing, it is important to realize that the windows, while they are incomplete, they occupy memory, memory in the state system of something like Flink. While that, this can be persisted to some kind of uh, uh, storage layer, it is memory that you are using. So if you are then having a load test generator that is not that clever and produces events with everything the same session ID or, or only a few session IDs, you will blow it up because none of the windows will ever get flushed. All of the events will stay in the application because that dinosaur is not taken out. And if you have this situation, you thought, ah, let's a terabyte of memory should be plenty. Ah, it's not. If you run the load test long enough, anything breaks. Another example that I've seen in production is something we call bursty streams, data that arrives in bursts. And a good example is something we were designing a while ago is when we have uh, partners that want to off, uh, upload data to our landscape. For example, a seller that wants to update uh, their prices. So we want to have two kinds of interfaces for these people, a REST interface where they can have a REST API uh, uh, with a single change and a file upload. So the REST API is, you know, API, some transport like pops up or, or Kafka and then some processing and then a storage in some, some database system. And in this example, I'm using HBase or Bigtable. And as a side thing, the file upload, and then every time the file arrives, you pull that apart into single lines and throw it into the same processing line, pipeline. Now, if somebody uploads, for example, a five megabyte file, that is cut into all the individual records, and the first two megabytes of those records just simply pass on into the database. The second two megabytes pass on into the database, and the last one megabyte will remain stuck in the buffer then somebody inserts a record via the REST API and another one, and they will simply be, remain stuck in the buffer. And then there are broken streams. And in production, we all go down for maintenance sometimes. Even the largest systems can go down for maintenance. And one of those very large systems I see is the Niagara Falls a very, very large streaming system that went down for maintenance in 1969. They put up a dam and shut it down for maintenance. And in our very simple application, having a disruption in the data stream would mean that, you know, data stays in the buffer and it's not written to HBase. So what are the kinds of solutions that we've come up with? How do we try to handle these things? Well, first of, all, the, first of all, the group by event time. It's slightly more complex than our simple example because we do multi-stage processing. It's not just the website, the Kafka, and then the Flink. We have an enriched, clean filter and crypt step in between with another Kafka topic. This step uh, determines visit. If a session is idle for more than 30 minutes, then a new visit starts. It slaps on geo IP uh, information. Okay, based on the IP address, what country? It disassembles the user agent string to figure out is it a phone or a tablet? And based on those uh, uh, assessments, we do our first uh, assessment or if this are, is this a robot or not? And last but not least, we apply some GDPR processing. For example, the IP address is cleaned, is nullified. So how do we do then change? How do we then fix this? Well, there are two primary solution directions that I've seen. Either you change the data, for example, you inject non-data records that are effectively just a timestamp. I'll go into that a bit more later. Or you change the processing. And in Flink, they recently committed a feature that allows detecting an idle timeout. So if a, a Kafka topic or partition uh, does not have data for a too long time, it automatically uh, marks it as idle and effectively says, You're, we're not looking at you anymore in terms of watermarks. I find it very important to stress that if you use this feature, you are mixing processing time 
and event time. You have an event time system and suddenly the processing time matters. It may be useful in some cases, I consider it a risk. So the way we try to handle this is that we now have a very simple single threaded dummy uh, component that simply creates every 500 milliseconds a timestamp only event that is thrown into all Kafka partitions. And the overhead is negligible. So how does that look? Well, the code is really simple. You have a Kafka producer, you just ask it for all the partitions and then keep running forever, do a sleep or something uh, and then get the time, create a single measurement based on that timestamp and then for every partition, send out that message. It is important to note that the message that goes into all of the Kafka partitions is identical. They all have the same key, the same value, the same timestamp. So how does that look uh, uh, in our streams? Well, a normal stream now looks something like this, where the green balls uh, represent the data and the red clocks the, uh, the, the fake records. But in a slow stream, you now have this. In a slim stream, you now have this. And if you have a bursty or broken stream, you get something like this. So you always have the, the timestamp uh, events in all partitions that trigger watermarks that make sure that processing continues. So if I look back at this drawing, what we have now is next to our website, in, uh, uh, ready to run in, uh, to uh, feed the data into Kafka, a timed event generator, which are essentially guaranteed front-end events. It's a very simple thing that runs in Kubernetes. And if it's not there, it's not too much of a problem because it's automatically restarted within seconds. So now, because of those events, if this intermediate component goes down for maintenance, the component at the end can detect the, the difference between the website is down and the stream is down. And the idle detection alternative that is new in, in Flink 111 will change the final data because it will start changing the way uh, the data is handled. So how do you see the difference between site down and stream down? It's actually quite simple. If the site is down, you have the watermarks, but no data. If the stream is down, there is nothing at all. And I think you should simply wait for the data to arrive. There is, however, a catch. The enrich step must handle it. All processing steps must um, be able to, uh, to work with this. So what you see is that uh, um, in our application, because we are maintaining ordering per session, we first do the Flink operation key by session ID, which routes everything with the same session ID to a single component. And then in the one component that re receives all the, water, the timestamp events, some kind of deduplication has to occur. And then at some point it has to forward all of these to the outgoing partitions uh, of the rest of the stream. And it's important to realize that uh, you must deduplicate and forward because the number of partitions in the incoming stream and in the outcoming stream are in general different. So if you have 10 partitions coming in and 15 going out, um, all 15 outgoing must have a, a timestamp event. I do realize that the ordering and the synchronization between the various streams is hard. So that's still, still something that we need to figure out how to handle properly. Any final uh, application must also handle it because now it re receives the data and the watermarks or the, the, the timestamp events, create watermarks from those and then drop the timestamp events. After that, normal processing can continue because the data will still be only the data. So this seems to work for us in our situation, but I am thinking, can we make this something more generic? Can we make this a feature that can go into Flink or some system like that. So I was thinking, what if we just redefine what we call our topology? 
So in the talk, in, in, in the example so far, we had two because we had two fling jobs. And at the start of the pipeline, it is important to realize that wall clock time, processing time, event time are all the same. So the events are created in the producing system, whether it's a sensor or a website or whatever, with the time at, of the machine at that moment. And then when it goes through the pipeline, we will create each time a watermark that goes th with it through the flow within the Flink topology and then is thrown away. Then the data goes into Kafka again and we repeat that in the, the, in the final step. So what if we look at it slightly differently? What, what if we have the same set of applications, but now we see this as the topology? And we call our event generator a watermark producer. Then we can say that the watermarks are created at the same timestamp as the wall clock time, processing time, event time as the data, and they are thrown into Kafka as well. And if then they go through the data, data stream, it's more like this. They are simply demultiplexed and multiplexed, deserialized and, and serialized every time they go in and out of a Flink component. The hard part, like I mentioned before, will be things like the filtering and the deduplication. Things I also realized is that this generation of the watermarks has to be done at a place that is consistent with all event producers. So if you have an event producer that does a lot of buffering, for example, an IoT device or a, an, a mobile app that caches the data for a quote unquote long time, then this system will also not work. I spoke last year at Flink Forward with somebody from Netflix and they explained to me that, for example, their mobile app is a problem because all the events of somebody watching a movie in the, in the airplane would delay the data a very, very long time. Also, the deduplication is very important because if you have a few operations within your topology, uh, the number of uh, duplicates of all the watermarks will be very, very great. Um, so that is something that I still have to look into if, in, on how that can be solved. And also ordering. I suspect that this will only work if you have a transport pipe in between that guarantees ordering. So the final step to think about uh, that we would talk about is the writing to the database. HBase, the buffered mutator with a two megabyte buffer, the default setting, but you can change that. Um, that was essentially written in the time of MapReduce. Everything was a batch. There were no stream processing systems. So the implementation simply flushes the buffer when it's full or when you close it down. When you do a shutdown, it does a flush. And with, if you have problematic streams, the data is stuck in the buffer, as I've shown. Now, the solution in these kinds of situations, in this, in this situation, was actually quite simple. So in 2018, I submitted a, a, a patch for HBase, which is now in the client libraries, that allows you to periodically check is there data in uh, the buffer? And if it's there for too long, well, you can set that in a number of milliseconds, uh, flush it. And this has solved for our streaming solutions the problems that we were running into. So in general, if you look at applications and you're trying to develop something and no data comes out, don't panic. Have a look at all the things I've, I've shown you, and it may be possible that in your case, it is a normal effect of the way these systems work. And I hope the, the scenarios I've given you will help you in, in solving that. Concluding this, what I have seen over the years is that the primary cause for all of these problems is buffering. Buffering in combination with problematic streams, and then the question, when is my buffer flushed? And if the buffering is done because of an algorithm, like a group by or a window, I recommend you solve it from the data or from the algorithm. 
And you can do that if you truly understand both your data and your algorithm. And in any case, I recommend sticking to event time. Avoid mist mixing in the processing time if you can, uh, but if your use case allows for it and it's not a problem, you can use this. And if you're buffering for performance, like a, um, uh, uh, writing the buffer uh, for a database or something like that, just use a timeout. Kafka has, the, the Kafka producer has something like that. Uh, there is a max linker time over there. Nowadays, the HBase has it, and it's quite simple to implement in most systems that are out there. Thank you for listening. Uh, this was my talk. Um, if you're curious about uh, the other talk I mentioned last year, uh, there is a, a link at the bottom of the screen uh, towards a playlist that I've created with the talks I've given uh, over the last few years. Um, so you can look it up there. Um, and I assume there are questions now. So let me see how that works. Niels, thanks for the talk. Uh, I don't, like I saw a few people starting to type, but then I don't see your question there yet. So let's give it another minute, otherwise, Yes. Uh, people might have more informal questions and we can use the breakout rooms for that. I'm really curious to hear what uh, people think of my opinion around the, uh, the way to handle watermarks in idle situations and uh, what they, how they uh, think of my opinion regarding the, um, uh, the idle timeout uh, system. All right, looks like there's a question. Yes, Max asks, uh, concerning the uh, slim and slow streams, wouldn't it suffice to use one, processing time triggers to trigger a window computation from time to time, or and two, add a time-based flushing to the uh, H-based output? Well, this is essentially what the new feature in uh, Flink does, the uh, first point. Uh, processing time triggers to trigger window computation uh, occasionally. Um, and my, my statement is that if you uh, use this in a stream that is primarily focused around uh, processing, then this will work fine. If you have a stream where the computation is based on the event time, you are mixing the two. Um, uh, and, 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 and that is the reason for me to, to think about um, uh, uh, that it will, will, will cause problems. Uh, because uh, now the data is no longer purely based on uh, the, the outcome of the processing is no longer purely based on the data, but also based uh, on the processing uh, of the pipeline. And depending on the use case, that is a very important side uh, uh, point to make. Depending on the use case, this may be fine. Uh, uh, and in some cases it won't. Uh, 